It's great to be here and to be thinking about the scriptures with you. Uh, and I was told that uh, what you're doing at the moment at City Light is looking through this book by a guy called Nijay Gupta, and he has uh, 15 words of life. And each week you're looking at a different word of life. And this week the word is hope. The word is hope. And if you read that little section in his book, uh, he begins with a quotation actually from a Star Wars film. He says, uh, Rogue One is his favourite Star Wars film. Happens to be mine as well. I've got kids and we are a bit of a Star Wars family. And uh, one of the, uh, the phrases of that film is, rebellions are built on hope. So rebellion, And so hope is this big thing that runs through that film. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because religions are also built on hope. Not just rebellions, but religions are built on hope. And the Christian faith, of course, you will know, is the faith uh, where we talk about that faith, hope and love. That little triplet that comes out of the letters of the Apostle Paul. Again and again, he'll talk about faith, love and hope, or faith, hope and love. And it's not surprising, is it? Because hope is essential to human life. Having hope is life-giving and life-sustaining. And having no hope is soul-destroying. Why is that? Why is that? What is hope? What are we talking about that's so powerful in our lives? Well, positively, positively, you could say hope is, is the hanging on to the possibility of something better. That's what hope is. Hanging on to the possibility of something better. Or, if you're happy with your life, hope is that wish for nothing to change. That's what hope is. It's future focused. Hanging on to the possibility of something better or the wish that everything will stay as it is. Negatively, hope is grasping on to the chance that we can avoid something bad. Grasping onto the chance that we can avoid something bad in the future. So when we have hope, we have a reason to look forward. We have a reason to do things. We have a reason to live. When we have no hope, we have no reason to look forward. We have no reason to do things. We ultimately have no reason to live. So, you know, I, I hope my favourite coffee shop is open on Sunday afternoon. I'll look forward to that. That would give me something to do with my day. That would make this day a good day for me. If I have no hope that my favourite coffee shop is open, ah, oh, well then I have to give up that thought and I have to just resign myself to the fact that that's not going to be part of my day. I really hope I see my family this Christmas. You know, that's something to look forward to. That's something to plan for. That's actually something that's a really enriching part of my life. If I have no hope to see my family this Christmas then I've got nothing to look forward to there and maybe even a bit of a, a bleak prospect of a lonely festive season in the second half of the year. I hope my financial situation improves. Well, I look forward to that. I set my eyes on it and I can actually take some actions now to build towards what I think is a possibility that could end up well for me. What if I have no hope my financial situation will improve? No hope at all. Then I become resigned and dejected and I just feel bleak about the future ahead. It's never going to get better. I really hope my cancer is curable. I really hope so because I look forward to that and if it could be then I'm going to go and get the treatment and I'm going to look after myself and do everything the doctors say to head towards that path because there's a hope that I'll get through this. If I have no hope my cancer is treatable, then I just look to no future. I can't plan for anything. I give up. I just resign myself to this being the end. Hope is one of the most driving impulses we have, along with fear. That's why all advertising you ever see in the world is based either on hope or fear, because the advertisers know these are the things that drive us. And as I've said, hopelessness is soul-destroying. 
don't know if uh, those of you who like to read old books, you might know um, Dante's Divine Comedy from the 15th century. Dante's Divine Comedy, set into three parts, and one of those parts is called The Inferno, this great kind of exploration of hell. And what does he say are written? What words are written over the gates of hell when people turn up at hell? The words written over the gates of hell are, Abandon hope, all you who enter here. Abandon hope, all you who enter here. Hell has no hope. And having no hope is like hell. Now, I just need to clarify something about Christian hope. Hope, as we think about it generally, often means wishing for something that's not certain. That's what we think hope is. I'm wishing for something, but it's not certain. You know, I hope the coffee shop's open. I hope I'll see my family at Christmas. I hope I beat this illness. I'm wishing for it, but it's not certain. Christian hope is quite different. Christian hope means something different. It means I'm longing for the day of something that is certain. I'm longing for the day of something that is certain. We might say it's more like an expectation. You know, I'm, I have great expectation for this day that's coming. Or if you were to read that book, that Nijay Gupta book I was mentioning, uh, it, it has a big overlap with the idea of trust. I trust that this is going to happen. I'm expecting this to happen. I'm looking forward to this certain thing. And just like all other hope, Christian hope, the object of that hope is really important. So hope is not a state of mind. You don't... People are not just generally hopeful. You hope in something. You hope in something. You know, I hope the coffee shop will be open. I hope I win the lottery. I hope my cancer gets cured. There's a very specific hope in something. And Christian hope is not just general, vague hope, but it's in something. And I'll come to that in a moment. It's good to notice as well that all our hopes are actually the expression of an ultimate hope. There's something that lies behind every little hope we have, be they big or small. And, and you know, it's kind of something like, ultimately what we want is to live well in, in fully satisfying goodness forever. That's why I want the coffee shop to be open, because that's part of living well in goodness now. That's why I want to see my family. That's living well. That's why I want to beat the sickness, because that's part of living well in a fully satisfying goodness forever. Just like all fears are ultimately the expression of one big fear, which is I'm going to miss out. I'm going to lose all the good things that give life and satisfy. Well, let's turn to the scriptures. I want to turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and just look at verses 13 through to 18. So 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. If you've got a Bible, you might want to look that up. If you want a phone, you might want to flick, that, flick to that. This is a letter of the Apostle Paul written to the church in a place called Thessalonica, up in what's now the way northern part of Greece, not the kind of peninsula, but the top part of Greece. In those days, it was actually, the region was called Macedonia. So the geography's, the map has been redrawn a little bit, but that's where we're talking about. And it was a great church. Uh, full of believers who were super excited about the Lord Jesus and who spread his message far and wide. But they had some things that they needed to think through a bit. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, let me read to you uh, what Paul says. He says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers. They're meaning brothers and sisters in uh, the way that the Greek language of the original text Um, meant it. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of, a trump, the, sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The Thessalonian Christians risked sliding into hopelessness about their sisters and brothers, their Christian sisters and brothers who had died. Uh, The language of of fallen asleep is used in the English Standard Version of the Bible, and that's just a metaphor. Uh, We often say that, don't we? Someone's fallen asleep. We're talking about them died, them having died. And so their great fear is this. The Thessalonian Christians think, our sisters and brothers have died, and the problem with that is, They had things a bit confused. They thought none of them would die before Jesus returned. They just thought none of them would die before Jesus returned. They thought Jesus would return in their lifetime. Uh, Since some of these have died and Jesus hasn't returned, they think they're going to miss out on the return of Jesus. You know, Grandma and whoever it was who died, we loved very much, they loved Jesus, they're going to miss out on his return. And there's no hope for them to see Jesus again. Paul says, not so, not so. He brings them comfort and he brings them hope, real hope, substantial hope. He says, we don't grieve like those who have no hope. There's a great line, by the way, because when you have something to grieve over, if, if, you know, grandma does die or something tragic happens in your life, the Christian faith says, of course we can grieve. We recognise emotion, we recognise pain, we know hurtful things, of course you can grieve. But our grief is different. It's not a hopeless grief. We grieve with hope, not grief without any hope. We grieve looking to a positive future, not grieve saying that's the end and there's nothing to hope in anymore. So we grieve with hope. Uh, And this is what he says to explain that in those few verses that we just read. Uh, He says, don't grieve like those who have no hope. Because whenever Jesus does return, we don't know when he's going to return, but whenever Jesus does return, those dead sisters and brothers, those dead Christians are not going to miss out on anything. They're not going to miss out on anything. In fact, they are going to be the first to rise from the dead and the first to be united with Jesus. So not only are they not going to miss out, they're going to be before us. If Jesus returns today, then dead Christians are going to rise and be with him today and we'll follow them. They're not missing out. They're, as it were, kind of front of the queue. And so we can encourage each other with these words. For those who die in Christ, there's hope. There's still hope. Even though we grieve, even though we miss them, even though we love them, there's hope. Because they will rise first. Now this is doubly helpful what Paul's saying here. Not only does it say we have great hope uh, for those who have died in Christ, but it also touches on the object of Christian hope. Remember I said Christian hope is not just a vague, we kind of hopeful people generally, but we hope in something. There's something we're hoping for. Our hope is anchored in a particular issue or a particular thing coming to pass. And this tells us what that is. What we're hoping for is not something uncertain. We're hoping in something certain that's definitely going to happen. And that is the resurrection of all people at the return of Jesus. Christian hope is not a vague hope. It's a hope that's anchored in a very particular thing. And that very particular thing is the resurrection, the rising to new life of all who have died in Christ. And the reason we can be certain about this, the reason isn't just, it's not just a kind of hanging on to something that could be a possibility. The reason that we have such certainty about this and we expect it and we trust in it is because it's already started. It's already started. People have already started rising from the dead, believe it or not. Well, it's not quite true to say people, it's truer to say a person. A person has already risen from the dead, shown us that resurrection not only is possible, but is something that happens in our world. Who's that person? Jesus. We just celebrated this last week, didn't we? This was Easter, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Day. 
And if you uh, look at another part of the Apostle Paul's writing, uh, you look at his first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, he makes a very strong and extended argument through that chapter about how the resurrection of Jesus gives us confidence in our own resurrection and the resurrection of all people who follow him. He makes a very simple case, uh, Paul, but powerful. He says, if Jesus has been raised from the dead, you cannot say dead people don't rise. If Jesus has been raised from the dead, you cannot say dead people don't rise. And more than that, he makes the point that Jesus' resurrection is not an isolated event. It's not just like this thing that happened to happen, but it's part of something bigger. Now, the language that Paul uses in that chapter is Jesus rose as the first fruits of all who arise. Now, the first fruits is language that's taken out of the Old Testament, uh, but it's very simple to understand. It's the idea of when there's a harvest, uh, some of the crop will start to ripen just a little bit before the rest, and then you know that the rest is coming. Um, I have a very uh, immediate example of this uh, at the moment. Uh, we have at our house a fig tree. Someone planted it there before we moved in, so we ended up with this fig tree. And uh, it's hit and miss. Some years we get figs, some years not so much. And this year I thought it was going to be miss. Um, the figs have been late. Uh, you go to the tree and you see these kind of half-ripe figs and they're not coming and you think, nah, uh, maybe it's a dud year. But then, one day, a couple of them get nice and big and fat and juicy. And that's a nice fruit, I have to tell you. Jesus was on the right track pointing us to eat figs in the Gospels. They're yum. And when you get the first one, you know, aha, the crop is coming. The first fruit is a signal that this tree is going to be fruitful this year. And I tell you what, that's true. We're up to the eyeballs in figs at the moment. I can't find enough things to do with them. We're dehydrating them. There's so many. But this is the idea of first, fig, uh, first fruits. rather. You get one, and that's a sign there's a big crop coming. And that's what it is with Jesus' resurrection. Jesus rose from the dead. And we're not just meant to look back at Easter Sunday and say, oh, he rose, that's interesting. What's that got to do with anyone else? What you do is you look back and you say, Jesus rose from the dead. That is a sign that humanity is going to be resurrected. And in fact, the resurrection of humanity has started in him. This is really great, isn't it? This is really great. It gives us confidence. It's not an empty hope. It's not a, gosh, I, I wish and I hope one day that humanity ri might rise from the dead. It's, well, you don't have to wish. You don't have to have that empty longing. You can look back and say, they will. We will rise from the dead because we've seen it's begun. Resurrection has started happening among true humans, of which Jesus is the ultimate example. And so we have great confidence in the future resurrection that's coming. Now, this is actually doubly good news. It's not just that great news that Jesus is the object of our hope and that we have great confidence that we will rise from the dead. But there's more than that. It's not just that there is life after death. It's not just that that's central, central to the Christian message. But that that life after death is good, is satisfying, is the best type of life you could ever possibly know. It's not just that we're going to rise back to the same life we're living now and it'll be more of the same with more sicknesses and more broken family relationships and more things that don't work out. We're not being raised back to more of the same. We're being raised forward as new creation people as people who belong to a world that has not yet come in its fullness when all the bad stuff will be gone. It's that fulfilment of all those hopes behind the little hopes, behind the hope for the shop being open and not getting sick and family being around. Behind that was that hope that we would live well in a satisfying life forever and that is what we're looking for in the Lord Jesus and what we've been guaranteed. Did you notice verse 17 in our reading? Verse 17 says... Then we who are alive, along with those who have died and been raised, 
We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And here it is. And so we will always be with the Lord. We will always be with the Lord. Always be with the Lord. Now, if Jesus is the Son of God, which he is, if Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, which he is, if Jesus is God, imagine being always with him. Do you think around him in the new creation is a place where bad things exist? Do you think around him in a place is a place where we're not satisfied, where our longings aren't fulfilled? Being always with Jesus is what we need to meet everything that we hope for in this life and more importantly, what's lying underneath all of our lesser, even if significant, hopes. You know, you hope actually that you might meet your friends at the coffee shop this afternoon. Well, what's lying behind that is a longing for relationship and being with the people you love and being with Jesus forever will more than satisfy that hope. You hope to see your family later in the year at Christmas or whatever it is. Again, that's a, that's a longing to sit around and share good things with people in good relationship and to enjoy that. And being with Jesus will give you all of that ongoingly forever. You know, you hope that your financial situation will improve. That, that's a hope, isn't it, to live a stable life, a life without worries for how you'll get by week to week, month to month, and hopefully even have a little bit extra to do some of the nice things. Well, when Jesus returns and we're with him forever, we will enjoy the riches of his kingdom that never fade or spoil or deplete or go away. When we're hoping that the sickness won't take us down or one of our loved ones down, what we're really hoping for is that the life we have will be preserved and we might be able to enjoy living and sharing life with others. And when Jesus returns and we're with him forever, that's exactly what we're talking about. A new life that's imperishable, unfading, kept forever. All of the things we hope for in this life, are underpinned by that big hope of living well, a fulfilled life that never ends, and all of that is met in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. You will want for nothing. You will long for nothing. You will not feel in any way that anything is missing when we're with Jesus forever. Again, this is why we celebrated Easter last weekend. On Good Friday, we praise God that our sins are forgiven. That the Lord Jesus hung on a cross, paying the price for all that we had done wrong, removing the penalty and removing the barrier between us and God forever, meaning that we are able to be in the presence of God. Because God can't accept sin into his presence, but those who are cleansed are welcome and get to enter into his presence forever. And we celebrate Easter Sunday, the day when God raised Jesus from the dead and showed us the future for all who follow him. If you follow Jesus, you follow him into resurrection life. If you want to be in the presence of the Father forever, the people who enter the Father's presence are resurrected people. When Jesus rose, what did he do? He entered into the presence of the Father because resurrected people belong there. He pioneered the way for us into eternal life after death. All of this is our hope as followers of Jesus. And it's not just an empty hope, it's our certain hope. Again, because we look back on Easter and we have seen that it has all begun. Our hopes are fulfilled in him. This is what makes us people of hope. And this is what, what makes us want to live now for that day, to live as Jesus people, as hope-filled people. Two things I want to say to finish up. The first is... What if you don't find yourself a person of hope? What if you're not a Christian believer? You're listening to this and, uh, I don't know, you guys, uh, I presume many of you here are Christian believers, but some of you might not be. Well, let me tell you, if you're not yet a person of hope, or if you struggle with the concept of hope, you are in exactly the right place. You are in exactly the right place. Because the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is the house of hope. Not the lesser hopes, not all those things that might be important in our life, but we have no guarantee they'll be fulfilled. 
but the hope that's certain and eternal and fixed and where we are headed. This is the place for you. And it might take some time for that hope to kind of wash over you and to penetrate inside you and to shape who you are, but this is the place where that hope will be infusing and infectious as you keep hearing the message of the Lord Jesus and seeing what it looks like to be one of his people looking forward to that day. You belong here if you're a person of hope. And the Church of Jesus is so excited to have you and to welcome you here. And secondly, what if you do know Jesus and you do have this hope and that is who you are? What are you going to do with that? Well, you're going to share it with people. You're going to tell people about that hope. Our world desperately needs hope. Our world desperately needs hope. People need this message of certainty about the future where everything will be set right again. And it needs it beyond the shallow hopes. It needs it beyond what the advertisers tell us in all the commercials that are based on hope. But they're often hope for such superficial things, such thin things, things that don't last, things that don't really satisfy our deepest longings. But our world needs that hope. Let me give you um, a statistic that I find quite shocking, but that really tells this story better than I could. Do you know what the most common cause of death for 15 to 24-year-olds in Australia is? The most common cause of death for people between the age of 15 and 24 in Australia? Suicide. That's shocking. Suicide. What causes people to take their own life? Well, lots of things cause people to take their own lives. But one thing behind so much of it is hopelessness. People take their own life when they have no hope. And you can look into this, you can research suicide and you can look at the causes of suicide and you'll find a pretty strong agreement that hopelessness is very close to the core of why people take their own lives because they don't see a future worth living because they have no hope and like I said before because having no hope is like living hell anyway now not everyone in our society is suicidal but lots of people don't have real hope and lots of people's hopes are very shallow hoping for Small things, the next little thing, just a thing to give them enough hope to get through the next day or the next week or the next six months or the next year. But not eternal hope, not hope that satisfies, not hope that gives peace and joy and calm and thankfulness. Not the hope of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, the guarantee that all who follow him, not only Follow him in a life of sacrifice and service, but follow him to new life, new and eternal life. That's the hope we have. How could we not share it with a world that desperately needs it? Now, I don't know how you do that. There's a hundred different ways to tell people the good news of Jesus. I'm not going to lay out a formula for you. But what I want to say is we need to be ambassadors of hope, people of hope. We need hope to be our message what compels people, what drives us and what we share with the world. Let me head back to uh, where I started, which is actually a little bit of an advertisement again for the Bible college where I work. What we do at our college is we train people to serve the Lord Jesus. And what that means is we train people to know the message of hope from the scriptures more deeply along with the message of forgiveness, along with the message of the Lordship of Jesus, we train people in that so that they might go out and share it with a world that needs to know it desperately. And I hope that all of us do that. All of us are Christian believers. But actually, and I'll be forward about this, what I really want to see is more people give their lives to that. That is, 
Make it your work. Make it your life's purpose. Make it your job. That, that is, I'm hoping lots of people will think about Christian ministry as a vocation. Sharing the message of Jesus as their life's work. Maybe uh, you know someone who you think should do that. Someone who's a passionate believer. Someone who is excited about Jesus. Someone who lives for Jesus. It might be that they're doing something else right now. It might be that they've got a great job. It might be that they're studying towards a totally different thing. That's a good thing to do. It might be that they have other plans. That's okay. God loves to disrupt that stuff. (laughs) God loves to say, hey, all that great stuff you're doing, it's great. I've got something even better. Follow me. Serve me. Maybe you know someone like that. I'd like to encourage you and and challenge you to just have a casual, friendly conversation with that person. Tap them on the shoulder and say, why don't you just pop into open night and find out what it might look like to get some more training that would help you live that way, that would help you give your life to service of the Lord Jesus in in a vocational sense. You might tap someone on the shoulder about that. You might ask this question. Actually, is it you? Not is it someone else I could tap on the shoulder. Is it, is it me? Is it, is it you? And as soon as I say that, I bet for many people there's a hundred reasons running through your head why it's not you. Uh, yes, it's a great thing to do for someone else, but it's not right for me because of this and this and this. Okay, that's okay. Here's what I want to challenge you to do. Pick your top three reasons why it's not you. Pick your top three reasons why it's not you. Lock them in. Then talk to someone else about them. And get them to tell you if they really are good reasons not to serve Jesus in vocational ministry. Now, it's not for everyone. I'm not saying everyone should become a full-time gospel worker. But I'm saying some of us have got to. And I'm saying uh, if you think it's not you, it might not be. But it might be. Think of the reasons why you wouldn't do this. And then ask yourself, ask someone else, are these really good reasons? I'll leave it with you to explore. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a person of hope. If you're a member of the church, you're part of the body of Christ, the people of hope. And our hope is real hope, deep hope, certain hope, eternal hope. A hope grounded in the resurrection of Jesus. A hope that satisfies all of our longings and is only going to get better. A hope that gives life a hope that sustains life, a hope that we have the privilege of sharing with a hopeless world to the glory of the one in whom we hope. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the hope we have in Jesus. Thank you that it's not shallow. Thank you that it's not empty. Thank you that it's not a maybe. Thank you that it goes deep and it meets all of our needs. And we pray you would help us to know that hope, know the hope of his resurrection and the life we have in him, no matter what life we have now. And we do ask you to help us to be great ambassadors of hope, spreading the message of Jesus. And we pray in your mercy, by your spirit, you draw more people into this. And ultimately, on the last day, there'd be so many around the throne praising the Lord, giving him thanks, and that in your kindness you might even... Give us the joy of being part of helping others to come to that. So we thank you for all we have in him, the hope we have in him, and we bring all of this before you in his name. Amen.